So I thought I'd add this uh, uh, to the talk. Um, you know, the, this paper uh, comes up in publications, you know, we, with those of us who do editorial stuff, you know, we're happy if a paper gets cited like five times for your journal, that really helps the impact of uh, whatever journal you're working in. I work with British Journal uh, for the editorial stuff. This Jamel paper that comes out every year, it gets like quoted like, I don't know, a couple thousand times. <laughs> like the entire impact of this journal is from this. So it's, it's out in 2018. Prostate you see up there is the number one um, type of cancer in men, 19%. Um, I estimated deaths, it's number two. 29,000, I think that's been higher in the past, you'll see the graph, so 9% overall with uh, lung and bronchus being the uh, number one cause of cancer-related mortality. And again, it's interesting, the, the diversity of, say, prostate next to the bladder statistics, so if you look over on the left, it's given you basically race, which is interesting, but also just sort of um, stage base. So if you look at localized prostate cancer, five-year survival rate's almost 100%, Compare that to bladder, where it's 70. Obviously, there's a dip when you look at distant uh, metastasis presentation, uh, but all stages very high, so kind of unique compared to some of our other GU um, cancers. Um, this, again, the stage distribution by race in terms of uh, localized uh, being higher than regional or distance compared to bladder, where there's a little more um, spread out of that. So this is the one we've seen for years that Trends in cancer mortality, the prostate line is kind of the maroon one in here. And you know, you look at the dates, so we know the famous PSA spike in the 90s and it just continues to kind of um, tail off despite all the uh, fuss about the uh, task force um, issues. Um, th this is all also in the Jamel paper too. I mean, a lot of us quote and pull slides out of it, but it's actually an interesting paper to read the whole thing just to have a broad view of of cancer uh, statistics. So for example, this table eight, 10 leading causes of death in the United States, it's a busy table, but go over here and look at all ages in men, number one, heart disease, then cancer, then accidents. But then it breaks it down into age brackets. So from ages one to 19, it's accidents, assaults, and suicides. Makes sense, not as much disease there. If you move over into what we deal with mostly, then in, in the 60s to 80s, then cancer is number one, then heart disease. Whereas if you go over age 80, then it's back to heart disease with cancer number two. And I'm sure you've heard that quoted many times. Most prostate cancer patients are more likely to die of heart disease in most cases. And this is kind of the ratios of probability of developing prostate cancer by decades, um, you know, very low in the... Uh, under age 50, but then one in nine for over age um, 70. Um, so then uh, the other thing that got my attention years ago uh, was, the, of course, the 2012 task force uh, paper on this and the evidence review that came out. And obviously, uh, I first drafted this type talk for uh, the August, the August uh, meeting um, for many of you, some of you people were here for the uh, think tank meeting at the Broadmoor. Um, in earlier uh, in 2017, the task force actually revised the guidelines from a C uh, from a D to a C. Although that still remains in draft, I keep looking at it and wondering why it's been in draft for uh, almost a year. But maybe somebody will explain. Um, and of course, so this is the, what got our attention was uh, 2012 giving a D. Now, um, and I was surprised at this. I love this quote. I don't know if he's angry about the D or maybe he's just getting screened for prostate cancer. Uh, there is some cancer in cartoon figures, so. Because um, we know that the screening recommendations do affect our work as surgeons. A longer version of this talk, I would take you through video uh, narratives of what happens in the operating room. Yes, we can diagnose and treat too early. Uh, you know, a typical uh, illustration would be an elderly patient with low-grade disease, uh, mostly with BPH, aggressively biopsied with a fusion MRI to find Gleason 6, and yes, some of them will insist on therapy, and sometimes they do get upgraded. The case I would do, it went from 3.3 to 3.4. And then there's the too late. You know, I had a recent case of a 58-year-old with family history, African-American, never screened until 58, and the first PSA ever he drew was 28, 12 cores of Gleason 7, of course, aggressive pathology and, you know, post-op hormonal therapy type things. And then, of course, you do hit it right, you know, a 45-year-old with family history, Gleason 7 contained, no controversy at all and excellent functional results. It's obviously easier to get that out of a 45-year-old. Um, but we know there's harms of treatment. This is a quote out of the 2012 task force. Adequate evidence showed that nearly 90% of men 
with PSA detected prostate cancer in the US have early treatment with surgery, radiation, or androgen deprivation. And yes, the revised guidelines show that we've taken a dent out of some of that number. I'm not sure if Scott or someone had that in their slides. I didn't catch it. I don't know what the 90%'s dropped to, but someone tell me if you've seen that. Um, and that, here's one that got my attention too was, because uh, I never knew this going through you know residency in the night because I, I was sort of a 90s trainee you know open surgery knowing that laparoscopy was coming so I had to kind of retrofit my fellowships around minimally invasive um, at the time they said five I don't know why they said five in a thousand men will die of prostate surgery within a month I don't know why they said five because I can do math you know even though I have kids they've gone through calculus so five in a thousand can also be expressed as one in 200 right <laughs> so or 0.5%. It's amazing what you can do with a napkin and a pen. Um, so I do 200 to 220 a year. So if that were true, I would have a death every year, and that would be depressing, and I would probably find something else to do, actually. Um, so I've actually only had one in 2,500, and he was a cardiac guy with stents, passed all of his tests, and he infarcted them on the table, and we absolutely could not get him back. It was terrible. Um, so it kind of sparked my interest of where that data came from. And if you look at the source data, it's mostly 1990s Medicare kind of data. And it probably was true if people were doing a lot of open surgery in older men with blood loss and all the transfusions. And, you know, you remember those famous stats like uh, when people would recertify for the American boards in the 90s, the average index case log for RP was like 20 cases a year. And I think on one slide from Jay Smith, it was 0.8 cystectomies in their research. I don't know how you do 0.8% of a, or what, of a cystectomy, but anyway. Um, so now, I mean, the robots, if, if it's changed anything, it's changed the fact that most people either do, say, 50 a year, or they kind of like do none, especially in large group, urology practice has had an influence. There's much more uh, specialization now. Um, so a, a project came across my um, radar um, of people asking uh, me to help them analyze this data. It was a, it, at the time, it, it, we had never heard of it, but it's in the literature now. It's called Premier Perspective Data Set, a large hospital-based data collection, mainly used for benchmarking and resource utilization. Actually, uh, I just learned at last year's AUA that uh, when Medicare wanted to kind of recode um, some of the issues around robotic prostatectomy, the premier data set was one of the sources they used to kind of look at you know, how effort and coding should go. Um, it can distinguish procedures really well because it knows what you're spending money on. You know, some of the early minimally invasive papers, a laparoscopic and a robotic code was the same, so you couldn't differentiate them. Premier can see the difference. It has a comorbidity score, but oddly enough, it has no path data. You know, so you can't like correct for that. So it's it you have to take its strengths and limitations. And early on, you, you couldn't capture discharge data, but we ran some numbers on it, and and kind of what's available of, of interest is sort of ORP open hospital or open radical prostate at any hospital, 43,000 patients, 347 hospitals, complication rate 16.5%. You can get basic outcomes like number of surgeons, age, op time, length of stay. So you can do kind of like a learning curve paper, and I put that in, into a journal a few years back. Then you can separate open, open prostatectomy done at hospitals that actually have a robot. We always kind of wondered, is there a difference in skill set? Or are bigger hospitals more likely to have a robot? Maybe they're better at doing the opens as well, or maybe not. Not a big difference in that. Then there's, of course, the robot and the laps. I always assume the laps are all Jerry Andrew by himself. So, right? Are you, are you hiding somewhere? <laughs> anyway, um, not that many by comparison. So there are fewer complications. It's a little bit of a longer operation. Other things are quite similar, actually. Um, when we went through discharges and mortalities, basically we were getting for open a ratio, instead of one in 200, it was basically around one in 1,000. Um, robotic was one in 3,000, and then lap one in you know, 346 in a small sample size. So those are very different numbers, but it was a fair statement in peer review that you know, if someone went home and died, this data set wasn't really designed to capture it when we ran these numbers in 2012-ish. So we kind of just sat there in abstract form, and so we just published the learning curve complication um, part of that. Now, last summer, though, the data set now can capture data sets, because at the time, I was trying to find anyone who had published a ratio of, let's say, if you have a, let's say you have a statistic of 30-day mortality, 
do you actually know what percent was in hospital versus out? And I couldn't find a stat anywhere, so it'd be making it up. So here we, we ran it. So um, and the number's a little bit different because now it, with more updating, obviously there's fewer opens and even more robots. See, in the same area, you know, you know it's much higher on the robotics. But overall, you see lower ratios, but one in 332 for open, one in 1428 um, for, for surgery. And then, let's see, I'm, I'm confusing myself. How do I go back? Can I go back? Yeah. Post-discharge, you see that it does account. So like, here's the hospital mortality from this um, 62 hospital, 17 post-op. So there are, it was almost, you know, maybe a third, um, 36 for um, robotic, 27 post-discharge. So it was not, it turned out not to be a minor issue of missing the post-discharge, DVTs, sudden MIs, or whatever it is that would get you out of the hospital but then have a mortality. So we'll try to dissect it. We're going to try to do a propensity analysis. It's just hard because you don't have great, you know, patholog pathologic data. We can do some on comorbidities uh, and age and things like that. The other little um, assortment that I presented also I wanted to share. Um, Chris Wallace has done a lot of work on mortality statistics that are interesting, focusing a little bit on radiation. Um, and I actually got to sit in on his um, um, PhD um, thesis, you know, they have an like external advisory board, so I was on the phone listening to him talk for like two or three hours with all the board and all this stuff and have to do a written review of the slides. That was a great experience. Um, so he had kind of the vague title of issues following prostate cancer treatment. He kind of put three um, projects together. Um, I sort of helped him rename all that. And, uh, and some of what he's done structurally is already in the literature and you, you can look at. So for example, he's done the analysis of you know, putting together all the systematic review of surgery versus radiotherapy and, and population-based data. And people love batting that around now that we have the uh, PROTECT trial and, you know, different populations. I won't get into that debate. A new one just came out as well on survival and complications, again, highlighting differences in surgical versus long-term um, complications of uh, radiotherapy. So uh, worth looking at. For the PhD, though, he, he did a little bit of an mRNA project. Um, but then he dove into this Ontario data set where specifically looking at mortality rates after radiotherapy, even at, with the ability to control for antigen deprivation. So you go through the whole you know, busy structural setup of how to get a population data set together and do a propensity analysis. And as it came up in the, in the, in the committee discussion on it, people either love these or hate them. Some people think propensity fixes everything. Some people say it's flawed you know, no matter what. Um, and so it's very structurally, you have to go through, you have to pick out all your variables and, you know, it's obviously very statistically um, driven. So non-prostate cancer mortality on the left is surgery, on the right is radiotherapy and you see, you know, a slight increase in mortality long term of radiated patients even after correcting for antigen deprivation use. You can drill it down on it, some of it being cardiac um, mortality, some of it being ischemic events. So I'm just giving you highlights. Um, this part's been, he's presented and talked about at various meetings, but it's, I, I still have not seen it published out yet. Um, and yes, you can then match it to um, population controls, people without cancer, um, and see kind of the same curves, non-prostate mortality, cardiovascular, um, ischemic events. So obviously the timing of this is very different. Surgery, you're talking about someone dying, you know, suddenly during surgery or shortly thereafter versus 10 years later, um, ba you know, based on um, a cardiac event or what have you, but still part of it. The other part that's just interesting, it's not necessarily mortality, but it could be, is sort of the, uh, the systematic uh, review of secondary cancers. So we looked at all the issues of bladder cancer, um, favoring uh, more uh, cancers over the future, colorectal cancer, rectal cancer, and then I don't have it on the slide, but lung was their control population that was a negative. So their conclusion was radiotherapy for prostate cancer increases the risk of secondary malignancies um, within the radiotherapy field, but not outside of it, and they had enough data to, to uh, propose that. So the concluding part of all this, because um, it's kind of fun, you know, in this new age of social media and Twitter is you can, you know, without even going to a meeting, you can have rapid access to all sorts of opinions. So 
kind of a famous social media guy. So there's a medical oncologist named Vinay Prasad. It's funny, at the same meeting in August, both me and Andrew had quoted him for different reasons. He's got a whole essay on the screening recommendations under the, the philosophy, and you can read this, but on, on the bottom I'll just highlight, there's a big difference between the phrase that screening might reduce the risk of dying from prostate cancer versus the phrase reduces the risk of dying. So it's the whole overall cancer specific versus overall. Um, so men must un understand that. So yes, even though the biomarker driven screening, you could reduce cancer mortalities, if we then have treatment-related mortalities, short-term or long-term, if you think about the numbers, you can almost undo some of the gains that we are all so happy about with screening programs. So it's important for us to identify treatment-related causes of mortality and try to minimize as much of part. At least the good news is that compared to you know, the, the initial uptake of open prostatectomy in the 90s, all those mortality statistics are better for open. As a robotic surgeon, I love saying that clearly the lowest incidence is uh, robotic for whatever reason. Um, so those are my uh, conclusion points. Um, I think I pretty much told you all that. <laughs>